How do you build a high-performing culture? This is Culture Architects. Candid conversations with extraordinary leaders sharing their biggest successes, failures, and lessons learned on their culture journeys. Here's David J. Friedman. Welcome back to my conversation with Dr. Anthony Mazzarelli, or as we call him, Maz. He's the co-president and CEO of Cooper University Healthcare, a hospital system who's got amazing practices that I actually have had personal experience with. Last time, Maz introduced us to his compassion-driven and evidence-based approach to culture building at Cooper. He wrote a book about that called Passionomics. In this new episode, we're going to get into more of Maz's experience in leading Cooper Health, especially during the recent global pandemic. You know, you, you talk about uh, your comments that your economic measures have improved significantly and and who knows how much of it you contribute you can attribute to this and we we get the same question when we work with companies on their culture is often people will ask us well what's the return on investment in this and i always say you know much like you that it's hard to isolate the variables you know this isn't the only thing you're doing there's lots of other factors that are influencing your economic returns but those are still the metrics though but they right? still like are at, absolutely at the end of the day you know, it's still, it's going to be the same metrics. That's what people say to yes. me. Well, what do you measure? I'm like, I measure the same stuff we always measure. Yeah. It's just the, how you get there, we think is by creating this kind of environment. Yes. And we've also, you know, what strategy have we put into play? I mean, our board is, is a big part of this too. You know, when you have a big nonprofit health system, uh, the board, a, a very involved board that thinks about strategy and, and, and what you do next and the future, that's part of this as well. Uh, and then having the people and blocking and tackling so they can execute it. Yeah, absolutely. And what I tell people similar to you is that while you may not be able to isolate those variables, it is an absolutely obvious conclusion that these things are major contributors to those results. And so again, in your case, yeah, it's not only this, you're doing lots of different things, but you'd have to be an idiot, honestly, to think that this isn't in a significant way contributing to moving those numbers in the right direction. I think an interesting thing to think about is what's next when we start talking about a war for talent mm -hmm. um, and, and culture. I mean, everybody is so focused on where they work, right? Oh, remote work. How mm -hmm. much is remote work? And, and they have, we have to also start thinking about when they work. So when you think about all the people that can remote, that you have working remote, if you run a mm -hmm. company, because we have a substantial number of remote workers too, because it's not, you know, healthcare, we're like a city. We employ every single type of person. We have yeah. cooks. We yeah. have, I mean, we have everything, right? Yeah. Um, it's not just where they work, but when they work. So everything now matters. You have to sweat the small stuff. So are you doing, you're letting people work from home, but you're doing Zoom meetings from 7 a.m. to 7 at night? Like, are you, you're letting people work from home, but are you giving them the flexibility of the value of working from home? Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to start. So we've instituted a couple of things, you know, that we, tr we try to sort of experiment with the senior team and then let people choose whether that kind of goes out. We do, you know, now we do once a month, no meeting Mondays where mm -hmm. no meetings, mm -hmm. go talk to your people, talk to each other, no meetings. We're trying to do little, you know, sweat those small things. Like at least for me personally, I know Kevin and I focus on this. I now take advantage of, the sort of technology that exists in Office 365, the Microsoft suite that we use, um, that a lot of people use Outlook and those things. Sure. Where any email I send from, you know, five o'clock on on a Friday, that email is delayed and not doesn't hit anyone's box until Monday morning. Mm. Even though if I'm working or if I'm working in the emergency department, I'm doing something over the weekend, nobody wants, you don't, you don't even want a nice email from work, <laughs> right? So let's start thinking about that. Maybe, so timing your emails to those that work for you, that you don't send them anything unless it's urgent, you'll wait till Monday morning. Maybe we should be doing that every day till the next morning to sweat those really small things. And those are going to be the things that that um, I think may separate why someone worked for you and work for mm -hmm. somebody else. And that, again, goes in the culture of serving each other. Yeah, yeah. I'm sending you an email because I need something. Let me pause, but how can I make sure I'm thinking about you when I hit the send button? Mm. That's that service mentality. Oh, it's because it says you're on vacation. So I'll just time it to hit your inbox on the day you get back, right? right? If it's really, it doesn't mean we don't do, we're open 24 seven. 
Yeah. I don't know why we have light switches in <laughs> parts of the hospital, but it doesn't mean that everybody works 24 seven. So thinking about those things, I think are the next level things you need to do to keep your people engaged and think about the culture you create and whether people want to work somewhere. Yeah. So take me back to, you know, you are clearly somebody who is willing to try things, experiment, see what works, see what doesn't work, adjust as we go. What are some of the mistakes you've made oh, that you I've, look back and think, oh, God, it sounded smart at the time. And now in retrospect, what a stupid move that was. Well, I mean, we only have an hour, right? I mean, that, <laughs> I, I unfortunately tend to learn more from my own mistakes than other people's, okay. um, which I think most people are like that. So there are a ton of things uh, I can think of. Some of them are very specific, mm -hmm. but a lot of things that I would do differently. And sometimes... Um, I'll give you two examples, but okay. sometimes those are things where it's not the idea that's bad. It's the execution, right? right? Yep. And that the quality of the, the effectiveness of anything you put into place is not just the quality of the idea. It's the acceptance of the idea as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're not thinking about change management and how you get people on board, you're going to fail miserably. Right. So here's a total failure, um, <laughs> that we had, but man, again, there's a million yep. of them. <laughs> When I joined the physician group, um, I got together with uh, our head of informatics. His name's uh, Dr. Snehal Gandhi. He's brilliant. Um, and he's, informaticists are physicians who are, who are experts at workflow. And they understand how the computers work and they understand they, they, they're really good at those things. It's actually a board certification. Now. Hmm. So we get together and, I, and we said this, look, what are the things we can do we have physicians, particularly primary care physicians, they're in the electronic medical record from five in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. We see the data, we can see it. Um, it's happening all across the country. They call it pajama time now. <laughs> so we say, how can we reduce pajama time? <laughs> and it was a mandate I gave the informatics group and we sat down and, and one of the things that um, our informatics group came up with was, you know what we, we need to do? We need to centralize medication refills. So if a patient calls into the office and they meet a certain set of parameters that we uh, we can automatically reorder that medication and they don't have, to, it doesn't have to go to the doctor in their inbox for them to answer. Because the doctors are constantly answering these inbox questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. You have an inbox for your email. They have an inbox for the email. And then they have an inbox just in the medical record for their patients. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, although that inbox, if you can't get it close to zero, somebody might die, right? Mm -hmm. So we're like, how can we get things less in their inbox? What we're going to do is we'll say for this class of medications, you meet the, the MR will automatically check these certain things and order it for you. So we go in and man, was I so proud of myself and like this, <laughs> they're going to love it. And I'm the white knight riding in <laughs> Snay Hall and I, and we meet with these doctors in a very busy practice and we tell them how great this thing is. And they just hammer us. I mean, <laughs> they rip us apart. Like that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. People are going to die. Like only, I'm the only one that can think about my patients that way. Like, uh, it, it's just, it's the approach was totally wrong, right? Because that idea needs to be something that we get them towards so that they can see the value to them and to their patients. You can't just pull the trigger on something. So they resisted. And it took a lot of time in talking to them and making sure it was the system they wanted, not the one we thought was good. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it took, a couple years. Wow. Had we done the change management right, we would have got in the right way. And I think we would have been able to do it sooner. And so I, what I feel really bad about is the other 55, 60, 70 primary care docs could have benefited from this early had we done that pilot better, but we didn't approach it the right way. And we didn't think about them. We weren't mm -hmm. other focused. Mm -hmm. We all thought about how our great solution was going to, was going to do things. And had we thought more about just basic change management, which we were all trained in and just ignored because we thought the idea was so great. <laughs> uh, and that's just one of, again, I could go on a hundred, you know, fails, but that that's one of them. Yeah. All right, give me one other, one other fail. So one other one was we rolled, uh, we introduced a program a couple years ago um, where we said, uh, and I still love the idea and we're going to reintroduce it. Um, and it was called, it, it was from a, a Harvard business case study of Commerce Bank. Mm -hmm. And they had it and they called kill a stupid rule yep. where if you submit a rule and the organization ends up getting rid of that stupid rule, you get a gift certificate. Mm -hmm. So, oh man, this is great. So uh, we rolled it out and we didn't roll it out well. 
and all we got were complaints. <laughs> and meanwhile, uh, there's an organization in Hawaii who called it "Get Rid of Silly Stuff," which is what we're going to call it. We, mm-hmm. we, we, I forget, we didn't name it well. I forget what we called it. We didn't want to say like "Kill a Stupid Rule." Right. Meanwhile, they're doing thousands a year of giving out these gift certificates and it's the most engaging thing they've ever done and mm. they're cleaning up their organization. So we're in the middle of figuring out what did we do wrong? Yes. What did we do? What, cause we're going to have to relaunch this and think about this, but we did something wrong because the org, any or other organization that has rolled this out has done really well with it. Yeah. And so we're sort of going through that root cause analysis now. Yeah. We, we used to do something very similar in my first company What I would do is I would ask our managers every six months just to ask their teams basically that same question. What's at least one thing that we do or a process or a rule or a system that we have that doesn't make sense to you? And, 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 and sometimes it would, it could be that maybe we had a process that made sense at one point and it's no longer relevant. Or sometimes it actually does make sense, but it was never explained very well to people. And after hearing it, they say, oh, okay, now I get it. I just didn't understand why. But what I was trying to do very similar to you is I wanted, I think there's a certain degree of stupidity that people expect and accept of companies. Oh, you know, you work in a company, there's a lot of stuff that's stupid. And I don't have to say, no, there shouldn't be no, anything not, we're doing not, that's not yes, acceptable. There exactly. should be nothing. There's nothing. There shouldn't be anything that you just pass. Well, it's just part of being a part. No, nothing. But I, I own, I feel like we own that here. I own that here. In other words, mm-hmm. if you're in a department that has a learned helplessness where mm-hmm. you're like, I'm not even going to ask because it's just, right. I guess it's just some stupid. We have to own that. That, yeah. that the whole, organ- all the senior leaders in the organization have to own that. Um, and I agree with you. I think, you know, the idea of, of getting rid of these rules it, they're just as important to get rid of as they are when the, you can't get rid of them to explain to people why yeah. you do them. That's just yeah. as important. Absolutely. Um, there may be a good reason. Yeah, I agree with you. And absolutely. Yeah. So take me back to, you know, you've been, you've been working on this culture stuff. How did COVID affect the work that you were doing on culture? Did it put in, did it interrupt the things you were working on? Did it add to it? Did it subtract from it? How did that impact things? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, we we sort of doubled down during COVID and said, well, this isn't the time where we ignore our must-haves. It's a time where you have to make sure you do them well, mm-hmm. right? Um, you don't stop practicing free throws when you get into the NBA finals, yep. right? Um, so we definitely focused on that. But there was something about COVID and healthcare organizations that's a little different than other companies because it was it was a time that was incredibly stressful but it also was a time where people, if, if viewed correctly, got to, I mean, the whole world was cheering for us. Mm. They were calling us heroes. They were, yeah. you know, it, again, the toughest time to have people work in healthcare wasn't during COVID. It's now. It's mm-hmm. a couple of years later, right? Mm. There's all of the kudos are gone. No one's banging pots <laughs> and pans for us now. And in fact, it's quite the opposite right now. We, it, healthcare is at one of its highest levels of violence in the workplace where wow. we have patients and patients, family members who are really? essentially attacking people that work in healthcare all over the country. It's not just wow. Cooper. Yeah. And so now it's, it's a lot harder than during COVID where COVID we sort of banded together. It is amazing how people, you know, everybody in healthcare ran into the bill burning building. You know, we know so much more now, right. but when you got to think back to what we knew at the time in New Jersey was in that early wave, right? It was sort of Washington state yeah. and then New York, New Jersey. Uh, and people were, you know, they were afraid that they were going to kill their families and bring yes. something home with them. And, um, and so it was a really stressful time, but a time where people really were able to connect. Hmm. I mean, we, patients couldn't have visitors. So our, our people ended up being the surrogate families for patients hmm. that actually gave some opportunities for connection that were never there before yeah. where people really were able to be more compassionate and connect more with patients than they have in the past in, in sort of an odd way. Right. So yeah. we're more isolated with respect to no one's going out and doing anything, but when, um, but you know, there, there are times where, you know, the example I give is uh, there was a famous picture out of Texas and it was a, a nurse and he was in one of these rooms uh, with a COVID patient and he's all got all his, his PPE on. And, you know, we would write at Texas, just like here, we, you'd actually write in marker on the ICU glass doors. Mm-hmm. And that's how you could communicate certain things. If you wanted to, that way you weren't writing things on paper and passing them back and forth. And 
um, or you're writing on a sign and holding it up. And so he wrote on this sign and holds it up and says, um, I'm just going to hold his hand for a while. I don't think he has much time left. Hmm. And that's, he's talking about the patient he's in the room with because the patient can't have a family member there because hmm. this is early in COVID. So when I first saw that picture, I remember thinking like, that is, that is the ultimate in despair. That is so horrific. It's just, oh man, there's nothing we can do. How horrible. And that is one way to think about that. And that will light up the negative pathways in your brain. That the neuroscience would say that, that, that hurts. That's empathy. And that's going to hurt. Well, then there's another way to look at that picture. And the other way to look at it is that nurse is doing something that is probably one of the most extraordinary things they could do in their entire career. The most important thing in that person's life in the final moments of their life. And it's a privilege to sit there and hold that person's hand. Mm -hmm. If you can see it that way, you will light up the reward pathways in the brain. That's compassion. It's empathy plus action. And that actually is protective. Mm -hmm. Now, you're still going to be worn out. Yeah. And it's still a hard thing to see. And I'm not saying there's not long-term effects you have to deal with. But it can be somewhat protective of burnout. And that's what the data shows. Yeah. So that, that part of creating a culture is having people see the value in the things that you're doing. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you a personal question. Okay. So, um, oh boy. It's personal for me, actually, not you. <laughs> so, right. oh, okay. so, so, you're, so you're off the I hook. Feel better. So I you're feel off better the hook. Then. Yes. I'm going to make <laughs> yeah. this easy for you. So, every doctor's office that you go to, uh, and, and our audience has had this experience, you're, you get into the waiting room and you sit there for 30 or 40 minutes before you're taken back. You get taken back and then you sit in the, the examining room for another 30 minutes before somebody actually shows up. And every physician's office acts as if, well, that's just normal. That's just how it, you know, how it is. I mean, we're in, in medicine, so that's just the way it has to work. And I look at that and say, from a customer service perspective, it's ridiculous and it doesn't need to be that way. And so I mentioned that, at the, you know, in my introduction that, you know, I've had different experiences with Cooper offices and every Cooper office I've been to, I've been seen within minutes of the appointed time. How are you pulling that off? All right. When I everybody think, else says you can't. I'm not sure we are. <laughs> okay. Let me give you the, here's the, here's the secret, right? Okay. Here's the secret. So the, the first way you get better at it All right. uh, is you work on scheduling and yep. your and your templates and you and the science behind. We have a wonderful chief experience officer who's a physician, uh, Dr. Francisca Jovin, and uh, before her was a, a woman named Terry Ricca, and they got into the science of scheduling. Mm -hmm. And you you would see that there'd be these things where you would some of the uh, some of the specialists would book all their patients in the first hour and then just spread seeing them over four hours. Yeah just so they could make sure they were there so they could see them, right? It was a scheduling system that was very uh, focused on that rather than focusing on what's the science behind queuing and those things. And we've gotten mm -hmm. better at that science. So the science of queuing actually helps us schedule better. But the second thing is that what's really clear, again, from you know looking at the data and being evidence-based, is if you inform people about delays they very much don't sense the delays as much. Yes. So I, I have no doubt that, that hopefully we scheduled really well and you went right back, but there's also a perception element yeah. there that if we're doing our processes correctly and informing you every 15 minutes or letting mm -hmm. you know why we're behind, it can, it's been shown that it can negate yes. that. Now, I, I can't give you a good answer of, why can't we be perfect, right? Like why? Because I always want to be better. Sure. And we're we're working on that. And I don't believe in the running from the bear theory of healthcare, right? So do you know right. what that, like yep. the, I don't believe in this idea that like, well, when you're running from a bear, you don't have to run faster than the bear. You just right. have to run faster than the guy next to you, right. right? We don't have to be just better than everybody else. No, yeah, yeah. We just have to, we don't have to actually, be, well, I, we want to be, we want to be good in and of itself. We, we want to yes. be better than others, but we also- uh, don't want to just say, hey, like we're just happen to be better than others. We want to try to actually catch the bear, right? Yeah. We're trying and, yeah. and, it, and it's hard, but really I think the answer comes down to science and that healthcare is getting better at rather than just, of we're in the business of science, but we don't often apply science to our business. Mm -hmm. That is happening more and more. We're very focused on that here. And I think as that happens more and more, these sort of sacred cows that you see in healthcare won't happen as much. 
Yeah. But there's ones that are hard, right? A lot yeah. of it has to do with the uh, the interplay of insurance and all this kind of stuff. And But we're trying to get through those things and trying to, you know, I always say sacred cows make the best burgers, right? So we have to try <laughs> to get rid of those. Um, but but I, I appreciate you pointing that out and, and we're trying to make sure we're more consistent with that. Well, and I would say, I, you know, you're not knowing what's going on behind the scenes in terms of that science, that what I hear in your answer is, you see it as important. And I would suspect that there's an awful lot of practices that don't see it as important, that that allow that sacred cow to be a sacred cow. That, oh, you know what, it's healthcare, that's just the way it is. And so if you don't see it as important, you don't look at the science about it, you don't work on that. And I think that's true of- I think that's right. Many, yeah. many practices. I can think of practices that I've been to over the, you know, over my lifetime, where that your, you know, your, your comment about, um, just letting people know where it stands. And, you know, you're waiting for an hour. And when you ask about it, they say, well, you know, we got delayed. And I say to them, well, if I were going to be an hour late for my appointment, wouldn't you expect me to call you and let you know I'm running an hour late? So why would that not be a reasonable expectation for you to give me or call me an hour before my appointment and say, we're running late. Don't come in at that time. Yeah. And it's like a novel concept to them <laughs> because it's been accepted as a sacred cow. So again, my, my observation is you've said this is important enough for us in terms of the patient experience that we're going to apply some science. We're going to make this a priority. Absolutely. Um, and if you think about it, right, the, the, the having team members that are happy leads to happier patients. Having happier patients leads to happier team members, right? Both things yes. feed that culture, right? Nobody wants to be complained at all, all the time, yeah. right? So- yeah. So, so, you know, as we come to the close of, uh, of our conversation, what strikes me, and I'm curious on your perspective on this, the work that we do working, we work with hundreds and hundreds of organizations, helping them to be much more purposeful, much more systematic about their approach to culture, which is why we even call this podcast culture architects, because it's the whole idea that we are purposely designing our culture. And one of the things that, that I've always felt in the work that we do with all these different companies is this is so darn obvious. <laughs> like, how do other people not see that if you treat people better, it's good, you know, in your case, it's better for the patient, it's better for, better for the caregiver, it's better for the financial results. I mean, this is not rocket science. This ought to be intuitively obvious. Granted, you and Stephen have done the, you know, have scienced it up, as you said, have, have done the research to prove your hypothesis. But even if you didn't do the research, this ought to be obvious. So from your perspective, I know there's no real answer to this, but why is this not so obvious to the rest of the world? I, I, think, in, I think it's like you mentioned before. It's also obvious that if you eat well and exercise, you'll mm -hmm. lose weight, right? Yeah. That, everyone knows that. I mean, if knowledge was all you needed, there'd be no like out of shape, overweight physicians and nurses. Yes. Right. Or ones like, that smoke. <laughs> yeah. Or ones that smoke. So it's, it's putting into practice. I think can, once you think you have a pathway, I think consistency mm. is really the issue. Doing something on a consistent basis, having it move into something that you just do automatically. Yes. Not something you have to think about. So the design is purposeful, but the execution starts to become second nature. Yes. You know, in in the work that we do, there's a, a, a language we use around that. We call them rituals. That when something becomes a ritual, we teach people to to define the behaviors that are important, which we call fundamentals, and we create rituals to practice those fundamentals over and over again. And a ritual in our language is exactly as you're describing. It's just what we do around here. And the reason that rituals are so important, exactly as you're describing, is because we're not always going to be disciplined and we're not always going to be motivated. But if it just becomes, this is how we do it around here, it's not difficult to remember to brush your teeth or to, you know, some people say a prayer before a meal or to do other things that just become part of our life. And that's what creates the consistency. It's the building yep. of those rituals. And that's what you've clearly been able to do it, uh, in the Cooper system. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Maz, I really appreciate you joining me. I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed at what you've oh, been able you. to accomplish in such a complex, large organization. And as I said at the outset, I've seen the evidence that, you know, from a personal standpoint, 
that it's working. There is something happening there that is clearly different than others. And to hear you talk about um, the things you're doing to make that happen are just fascinating. So thank you for joining us. Thank uh, you. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And that's it for today's episode of Culture Architects with my fellow culture architect, Dr. Anthony Mazzarelli, or as we call him, Maz. He's the co-president and CEO of Cooper University Healthcare. Folks, if you've been enjoying our show, make sure to subscribe, and that way you're automatically going to get my new episodes when they come out. Also, if you have a minute, I'd love it if you just left us a review, and that way more culture fans like you can discover the show. See you next time. This has been Culture Architects with David J. Friedman. Join us next time for more insights and wisdom from great leaders in all walks of life. To book David for your next event or to learn more about his writing, speaking, or consulting, go to davidjfriedman.com. Culture Architects with David J. Friedman is a production of CultureWise.